Okay. So hello everyone, welcome to this um, AMA Ask Me Anything session with uh, Pascal Emmanuel Michael, who is currently um, coming towards the end of his PhD course, I suppose, in um, focused on psychedelics and their relationship to the near-death experience. So uh, thanks for agreeing to come on, Pascal. Uh, so far there's not many people joined in the Discord yet, but that will... I'm sure the numbers will come up and we'll have some questions. So if you are watching and it's just not showing up on the numbers, if you have any questions, feel free to um, either put your hand up in the Discord or write your um, your questions in the YouTube chat. I'll note them down and uh, and ask Pascal each when we get round to doing it. So uh, Pascal, to begin with, would you like to briefly introduce yourself to those of you, those of us who haven't um, maybe heard of, of you and your work? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, so my name's Pascal Michael. Um, I'm uh, as as you said, I'm at the end of my PhD at the University of Greenwich, and I'm looking into the really the bottom line of what I'm looking into is 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 what the best kind of explanatory framework there is for the near death experience phenomenon, and I'm looking at it specifically from a psychedelic perspective so that's uh, that's what i believe that's what i think the literature suggests that's what i think my data you know is certainly pointing to that psychedelics um do have do offer the, the greatest explanatory power as a as a not just as a, as a model necessarily for the near-death experience because that that just implies that there's that psychedelics what are can just represent a, a model like as in a scientific model which is a kind of facsimile that's that can be used for manipulative purposes to understand the phenomenon better but it may actually be that that the near-death experience is uh an endogenous psychedelic uh experience so it can be produced from endogenous so i.e intrinsic um psychedelic compounds or or neurotransmitters which can have similar psychoactive effects um or just that there's a even that that itself doesn't need to be doesn't need to be the case per se that just because these experiences i mean i'm looking at dmt specifically dimethyltryptamine just because of that and the near-death experience have a lot of these parallels that uh, doesn't per se mean that endogenous dmt is responsible for producing it uh, it could well be that what DMT ultimately does in the brain, that brain activity, that kind of end point brain activity may also be transpiring in, in, in the near death state, right? Um, so, so yeah, and it's not just the experience itself. It's like the, the trans, the, the, the after effects or the transformative effects as often mm -hmm. as called of the near death experience. And then the kind of positive outcomes or or benefits in, in terms of well-being or, or, or various psychological outcomes um, that we're now seeing that occurs after psychedelic experiences, not just within clinical spaces, but within retreat settings, even just observationally, just asking the general population surveys and stuff. So that that marries up. But I think one interest one one thing that interests me the most, and that's I guess why I wanted to explore near-death experiences in the first place, is kind of anomalous experiences right so so parapsychological or, or other type um phenomena that they occur not just in the near-death kind of context but but also with psychedelics so yeah that's it's a good model in, in all of the different kind of respects so, yeah. mm -hmm. okay um so we have one one guy a friend of mine panda who's listening who i know will have a, a ton of questions and um, panda is well his name's not panda but his huge name is panda uh, he has a um a strong interest in near-death experiences and i think i believe panda you have a an analytic idealistic kind of perspective on consciousness and life which um follows with bernardo castrop's kind of thought so mm. uh, do you have any questions for for pascal panda hi pascal thanks for coming here hi panda uh, uh, yeah, you yeah, criticized criticize Bernardo Castro's, Castro's uh, um, uh, conception, uh, conception of the psychedelic, of the psychedelic experience, mainly acts from reducing brain activity. activity. Do you elaborate, Do you elaborate more, more on that? that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. sure. Um, like, he's, he's right, right to a degree, degree. Um, um, but he, he over-extrapolates the, the, the kind of minimal neuroscience, which is actually citing in order to bolster his 
his, his idea, idea was to paint. paint. It's not, not that, that I am I have any any able or anything against idealism. If, if anything, if you could catch me on a particularly less nihilistically inclined sort of mood, then idealism or you know dual dual aspect monism probably is what I would be quite uh, predisposed to. to conceiving of the universe but yeah, really but it's just he um so he was only as, as far as i could see he was only really citing the early the early psychedelic neuro, neuroimaging work and that's been not superseded but well it's been elaborated a lot and it's we, our neuroscientific understanding of the psychedelic state is extremely sophisticated now so he so he was just referring to pretty much the first studies 2012, uh, I think. Um, for instance, like Robin Carhart Harris at Imperial looking at the psilocybin, like the, the magic mushroom sort of state based in, in, under, under magnetic resonance imaging, right? And finding that, which is against what people typically assume. But then, you know, you got to remember these drugs were, these psychedelic, you know, hallucinogens have been illegal, um, including for. For researchers to, to, to research you know, since um well for, for 30 years at least but then it's only now that you know since the turn of the millennium that the neuro this sophisticated neuroimaging had, has been has been available so it's so, so neuroscientists had their vague ideas as what a hallucinogen might look like in the brain but they actually had no clue um and so it was just a bit of a bit of a, of a surprise when they found decreased activity when they assume that hallucinogen means you know more activity you're seeing things that aren't there there's going to be more activity in the brain but they found reduced activity um and that seems to be where castro stops and then he sort of extrapolates on that and he says well clearly that means that the brain is kind of redundant and it, this is basically good evidence for the reducing valve hypothesis of of the brain but in a metaphysical sense you know and that consciousness is a non-material entity um or that indeed it is it's primary and gives rise to, to materiality um and so yeah that in with that model it would make sense experimentally to see an inverse correlation between brain activity and experience um but actually you know while that you know he seems to have sort of tied a nice little bow around that and it looks neat the fact is is all the different Neuro, you know neuroscientific studies which have been done subsequently they have been finding you know these nuanced differences in brain activity under a psychedelic state such as what the this lower uh, activity not necessarily just being a, de a diminishment in activity but being a disintegration so uh so of of specific what are called intrinsic resting state brain modules like the default mode network the dmn which you might have heard of so that's the kind of state that we're pretty much inhabiting um and is 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 um responsible for kind of self-referential thought and mind wandering of the past and future and stuff like that so that though that is basically the prefrontal cortex the the posterior singular the um in the the um inferior parietal lobule those are the kind of main those three areas but they're statistically associated with that with each other so when when one of them's active the other's active and they work together they're kind of like one they are a network so they work together in the psychedelic state it's disintegrated whereas it would normally be integrated and that that what that you know gives rise to core components of the psychedelic experience like the mystical experience for instance um, I mean that's 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 the kind of best sort of neural evidence for that sort of thus far, where you, it kind of encodes your ego and then it suddenly is disintegrated and you have this experience of ego loss or, or you know ego death and stuff. So, um, but it goes on from there. So it's so with the, with that disintegration of these specific neural modules, there are um, there's a concomitant integration, a global integration. Um, what's been referred to as a desegregation of modules which are normally not associated with each other, with each other, suddenly becoming associated with each other and being active when the other, the other these other networks are active at the same time. So this is rich hyperconnectivity, and on top of that, there's there's entropy increase. So entropy being a kind of index of 
of uh, of unpredictability or uncertainty or kind of chaos in the system um or what's been referred to as like free energy um, coming and it can be equated in some sense to 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 information um but it's but a good kind of analog of it is complexity like the brain becomes far more complex in a global sense and there are more kind of neural activity motifs than would normally be the case in the normal waking state which is kind of dominated by this default mode so that default mode op op operates in a very top-down uh suppressive kind of manner and actually narrows the this entropy narrows this the the number of of activity motifs that are available and so when that's disintegrated it's all, all all this um activity is actually burst in, into 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 existence really um and so so far from having reduced activity if you simply just nuance what we we're actually talking about when we talk about activity and talk about connectivity and entropy and things like that then suddenly in a way the original neuroscientists who are expecting more of this activity with hallucinogens were kind of right and then it sort of undermines what what Kastrup is is talking about does that does that make sense yeah um i've heard these arguments before and i've also heard Kastrup's counter response to them so and his counter responses uh, yeah um so i'd like to mention that most of the studies that have been done in psychedelics since 2012 have have been consistent in their results like uh decreased uh, cerebral blood flow decreased oscillatory activity so on um as for entropy well entropy increases only by a measure of 0.005 percent on a scale of one to uh, zero to 100 so one could say that it's a very tiny effect and in some subjects the effect goes the other way around their entropy either doesn't increase or it decreases and they still have a psychedelic trip so I don't think that's a plausible account of the phenomenal the, the 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 qualities of experience under the psychedelic trip. Um, okay, well that's interesting. I mean, I from all the literature you know, that I've read, it seems like entropy is a pretty good uh, index of, of 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 the experiences. Like there are you know strong positive correlations between facets of the phenomenology like just pure intensity for instance i think that was the case with the dmt trials just dmt uh intensity of the experience was almost you know linearly you know correlated with with entropy increase um you know and you find and it seems to be quite significant entropy increase you know it's not it's not marginal otherwise it wouldn't be reportable you know there is there is there is statistic like significantly increased in a statistical way entropy um in the brain under these conditions and it correlates with uh it not just correlates with the acute experience um and the peak experience of the psychedelic state but also certain after effects so openness for instance this trait of openness in the personality domain of being open and open-minded um that is being you know found many times with different psychedelics but mainly at the beginning in psilocybin that the ent ent increase in entropy is also uh you know, predicting of, of of that so it's um yeah it's uh it's i just the thing is i don't i'm not throwing the baby out of the bath the bathwater when it comes to cash drips you know metaphysics it's just this isn't the best r way for him to go about uh supporting his his, his idea um but yeah i mean it's it's a if we go deep into it like i i i i, I it's it has incredible implications you know i was just listening to a to a lecture by robin that he did at the uh the two song con conference and consciousness recently and and he was citing some papers so again papers looking at um more nuanced you know uh data and uh, analytical techniques of and and rep representative techniques of of what the brain looks like under psychedelics and who's uh demonstrating energy landscapes and again i kind of analogize this entropy increase to 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 free energy um which is carl friston's uh idea of 
um, this energy, you know, the kind of broader sense of the term, which is normally constrained by hierarchical, high-level high, high and hierarchical neural networks. And that's literally, I mean, it's not just the brain's raison d'etre and, and operand, modus operandi, it is like life's where there is a minimization of entropy um, by by organized um, organic, you know, sort of structures, basically. Um, and so looking at that in the psychedelic state, the, the different, the modularity, which is normally the case in, in the brain, um, when that becomes diminished and different modules become less distinguished from other modules because they're suddenly all cross-talking with each other now, you can visualize that as, a, as, a, as an energy landscape. And normally when they're the normal state, when there are deep troughs and wells, which basically just symbolize the differentiation between between neural modules it suddenly becomes flattened um and that and so the, the brain is kind of flat in a in a way it's certainly not i don't mean flat line that's a complete misconstrual it's just in this representation the energy landscape of activity and differentiation between the brain is, is sort of flattened and then that also kind of parallels this other you know kind of uh proposed correlate of the mystical sort of non-dual state of kind of oneness which is the 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 paralleling in activity of the default mode network and and task positive networks so default mode being kind of introspective and mind wandering and the task positive networks being like when you're engaged in a particular cognitive uh, or physical kind of activity and those are antagonized normally so you can't really do one while doing the other normally so let's we're talking now and i'm inhabiting the task positive let's say and my default mode would be a little quiet but in the psychedelic state they're equilibrated so it's almost like the, as far as the brain is concerned the inside and the outside are the same you know and so that can also it makes good neural sense for the for the psychological you know phenomena of, of feeling that there's oneness so all that said you know it's hard for me to, to to dive deep into all of this literature because because like I, because it's i mean it uh it basically it's just a, another example of 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 the sciences quashing um religious spiritual cosmologies because you know there are ancient shamanic practices the uses of these of these substances within religious contexts and it is, the, it is these experiences which are literally informing all of their you know cosmovisions which are non-material ultimately uh, but then now suddenly you know western modern scientists come to the floor and, and start taking these substances apart and they're finding that it can all be explained by the brain you know if you've got sophisticated enough data analysis and, and technology and uh it's difficult um, if people have certain, you know, preconceived ideas, or, or, or if they simply believe, if they are theists, if they just have faith. It's very challenging, um, and I'm not any different in that. You know, I mean, I don't have any specific a priori sort of, um, you know, beliefs per se. But um, but what what I'll finish this with is just by saying uh, I try to hold it them both in 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 my mind's eye. You know, and that i think is the hardest uh, kind of quest or, or whatever for when people are trying to talk about science and spirituality like to actually reconcile like the brutest of things which the neurosciences are saying in the most reductionistic sense and still hold some possibility for for uh, like a you know what castro might be you know propounding you know metaphysical idealism or or, or, or the reality of you know anomalous non-local phenomenon in consciousness, like for all we know, it is this the fact that there is, and you know I will stand by that, like there is all of these indices of of of, of activity in some way or another in the psychedelic state, um, that 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 despite that it could be it could be still that could still account in some way for um but not in a non sorry in a non-reductionistic way uh it could mirror even 
um it could like this activity could even mirror the soul you know if you, if you really really want to go you know it, it, the, the brain can act like this and then at death let's say and as i'm saying like the whole thing of what i'm saying is like there is similar neuro neural activity in psychedelic state and the near death state but then you know we don't know after de after death after total physical degradation then the for some insane reason but again like we don't we don't know anything so we have to be humble and open-minded it could be that the brain activity in psychedelic state and near death could actually mirror the quality of consciousness in a non-material way does that does that make sense yeah, I think it does. And I think what you said about uh, the brain perhaps mirroring the soul jives very well with what Castro is saying, which is that the brain is just what the soul looks like. It's the outer appearance of your inner mental states. Um, when it comes to entropy, I mean, I'm looking at this paper by uh, Robin Carhart Harris and uh, the other folks who came up with the entropic brain hypothesis. And yeah, what Castro said seems to be correct. The increase in entropy is, although it is statistically significant, the effect size is very tiny. I mean, it's uh, like 0 0.005 on a scale of 0 to 100. And sometimes the effect goes the other way around. So for me, I don't think entropy is a plausible account of the psychedelic experience, especially when you consider that other experiences, other hallucinatory experiences, like dreaming experiences, like uh, schizophre schizophrenic hallucinations, and even waking experiences, they they correlate very well with brain metabolism, with metabolic act activity increase, not just tiny increases in entropy. So mm -hmm. yeah, I just say uh, the effect size seems implausible, I I'm, and. I would also say that the fact that the effect sometimes goes the other way around makes the hypothesis very implausible for me. Mm. Well, I'm not even aware that, that that there are instances of decreased entropy in the psychedelic state. Is that is that something which you're saying that you've identified in these papers? Yes. The cash saying or... Yes. Well, that's interesting. Um, I haven't noted instances of actually decreased entropy, but then, perhaps, um, you know, that's only certain a certain number of, or you know, a, I would presume a marginal number of people in these in these studies, and there are people who do report no experience, even with 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 very psychoactive doses. So they might be those people. Um, perhaps Panda, if you have access to those um, papers, could you drop drop them in the Discord chat so that Pascal can have a look, maybe? In his own time, not now. It wouldn't be time. Definitely. I'll, uh, where should I post it? Just post it in the lounge, I think. Okay. We also yeah, have... I've, a, a, I've read the papers, but if you want to if you want to actually highlight those exact parts that you're talking about, then that, that might be more useful. Hmm. We do have a, a comment, more of a question from, uh, from Daniel, who says... Um, Yes, makes sense. Hang on, sorry, but I'm just going to have to mute you temporarily, Pascal, because I've got a bit of a bit of a uh, echo. Uh, Daniel says, yes, makes sense, as ultimately Kastrup's metaphysical argument is not based on empirical evidence, and his view goes beyond the reducing valve hypothesis. Um, if you'd like to comment on that, I suppose, Pascal and, and Panda, because I'm sure you'd have a, an opinion on that. Panda, does that mean to mention on that? Uh, Pascal can go first, I guess. <laughs> it goes beyond the... Well, yeah, I mean, it, um, I mean, if he's, if he's a proponent of metaphysical idealism, then, then, then the, the idea of the hard problem of consciousness, like it's been considered as by some as, as a intractable, like metaphysical question. And so in that sense, there is not going to be any, any empirical data, which will, which will be able to influence the, the, you know, the outcome of our ideas about it at all. Um, but then, that's what he does do and you know i'm able to weigh in on, on the kind of nuances of the neuroscience um that he cites um so he is trying to leverage empirical uh you know experimental data and stuff um but then he also does that with quantum physics and string theory um and i'm by no means <laughs> i know you know zero about about quantum physics in a real sense so but it it just concerns me that because I'm, I'm more kind of 
familiar with the neuroscience, I'm able to weigh in on that. If a, a string theorist were to be able to to listen to his stuff, he might have problems with what Kashtrup is, is is proposing as well. Um, but but yeah, the 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 um, the the reducing. So it goes beyond the reducing valve. He said. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the reducing valve. It's so he's that was originally a uh, Aldous Huxley, right? He, he he he. Well, it wasn't the term was, but then it was actually. Oh, it goes way back. It goes back to a particular um, uh, um ancient Arabic. Uh, Figure who I've now forgotten, but then sort of Kant then elaborated on similar themes, and then there was Helmholtz who kind of developed the idea of the Helmholtz sort of device or machine, which then generate was the sort of first modern um, rendition of of this predictive predict the idea of predictive processing, and then that can be applied to how the brain works, uh, and then that's. Um, and that's now, you know, a, one of the, the leading unified theories of, 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 of brain function. Um, Carl Frisson's like free energy principle and, and you know, the, the predictive coding uh, approach. Um, but then, yeah, so this is what Huxley was referring to when he referred to the reducing valve. He was getting it from, from Henri Bergson, um, who as a philosopher was, was thinking about the brain as... Uh, filtration device and you know Huxley wrote that it was sh it filters mind at large such that we're not basically exposed to every piece of information in the universe um, so it's usually sourced it's all cited in, in, in this metaphysical sort of sense but then if you do look at like Friston's model and then and then uh, and then Robin Carl Harris and Carl Friston did and 2019, right, Rebus and the anarchic brain. So they were both coming together and they're basically just combining the entropic brain theory and the predictive processing theory. They're kind of two sort of theories and un uniting them. And so, as I kind of alluded to before, it is the idea that there are higher cortical systems for, for encoding a kind of generative internal model on the basis of everything that we've learned not just developmentally but kind of evolutionarily and there and it's comp computationally encoded and that that imposes a, a top-down constraining inhibiting effect on sensory information and and what would otherwise be novel like new information and that new information updates all of these so-called like priors like like beliefs about what the world is and it's this constant process. Um, but ultimately, the brain is very static in its model, and you know, only samples kind of the different the discrepancies between the world and outside and the world inside. Um, but that, when so under psychedelics, there is this kind of reversal of that system, and uh, and deeper kind of areas of the brain um areas of the cortex which aren't high level kind of associative areas they the sort of sensory um areas of the brain they are disinhibited and they and there's this bottom up flow the direction of information flow in the brain is basically like reversed and there's bottom up flow of sensory information dominating the perceptual space um and in not just external perceptual but also intrinsic so from areas like the limbic system, activity from there is also released. So there's entropy into the system. And ultimately what Carl Friston has referred to as, as energy, which is free. So the basic principle for why he's referring to it as free is because energy, the kind of, if, when, if you op operationalize energy as, that, as work done for the survival, for the homeostatic, regulation and therefore survival of the organism if it's free then it's energy that isn't doing that and is being disinhibited outside of its normal conditions of use and it's um, just let loose free into the into the nervous system um so that is a is a neural equivalent 
which actually means the exact opposite of what Huxley and others are referring to the reducing that as because it's not reducing consciousness from a non-local space it's actually just reducing consciousness from within the brain okay so let's um let's move on back to psychedelics and near-death experiences and things like that um i have a question from um daniel fernandez and we'll answer this before we get on to the study that panda um wanted to bring up uh, he says sorry asks one curiosity is on what basis you and uh imperial are studying uh, NN DMT and not 5-MeO DMT, which seems more identical to NDE's phenomenology. Okay. Um, well, so the this 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 yeah. So Chris Timmerman Imperial he did look at NN DMT uh, and how it compares to near-death experiences, but literally purely on the basis of giving them both the the, psych the psychometric questionnaire at the near-death experience scale, right? And uh, that's pretty much where my whole PhD spr sprung from. It's like that's very limited way of looking at the similarities and differences. He found that they were identical, just using that particular empirical approach. Uh, if you spend three bloody years looking at all the phenomenology and all the absurd and nuanced phenomenology of it, as I ended up doing, um, it's, it's evident that there's let's just say way way more to it than that but um yeah it is sometimes yeah so it is sometimes said well i'll first say sorry that that his study was based on um iv lab uh and in dmt and, and ours the phenomenology that i'm looking at and the comparisons i'm making is based on also an dmt but from our field studies the first field study of, of dmt use and comparing them to, to near-death experiences so but in a thematic uh, way looking at the actual quality of, of the experience so it's often said that 5-MeO yeah is like death um, and it's pure white light uh, basically it embodies in a kind of ironic way to use that word the mystical experience the peak mystical experience so it's loss of ego, total oneness with creation, total disintegration of con constructs of time and space. There's no sense of noetic insight that you remember or are aware of everything. Um, kind of like, you know, what Huxley was saying, that you know everything in the universe once the reducing valve is fully uh, flipped. Um, so, but then it's actually not that much like near-death experiences actually if you i mean you might conceive in a very in from a indigenous or from a from a from a eastern religious perspective even from an you know kind of abrahamic religious perspective if you go the kind of more mystical zones of them and you actually theologically really look at what the facets of god actually are like from all those perspectives you would presume that after death that is this kind of description of 5-MeO that I just gave. That is what one would experience, this like merging with the Godhead and uh, Nirvana, you know, Muksha, liberation from samsara, and and that seems to be uh, the, the, the Nirvana kind of state. Um, so in that sense, yeah. And so maybe 5-MeO is a better model. Um, but the thing is, is we're only comparing a drug state to religious um, kind of delineations of, of what of what the core of the universe or the post-death state, uh, if you're enlightened at least, is. Whereas if you were to compare uh, near-death experiences, which is, I guess, more empirically kind of what we have to go on in terms of what death is like, or at least the dying process, and some people go very far in, in their near-death experiences, um, albeit inevitably they're only near-death, they inevitably come back, and so we're all aware of that. But um, yeah, so if you compare different neurochemical you know, drug models or simulations um, uh, with, with the near-death state, the phenomenology of, of, of NDE specifically, then 5-MeO doesn't really look like them at all. Um, and it's only, but then, you know, the, these aren't just, these aren't just, 
simple categorical things we're talking about, like the, it's very heterogeneous and near-death experience is extremely diverse. You know, it's a bit of a misnomer to say there is the near-death experience. All the near-death experience means is that you had some conscious awareness at a time when you were near death and it had and there was there was some features to, to, to your experience. Um, it's a difficult thing when, you know, Bruce Grayson comes along with the scale in 1983 and says, you know, if you get seven out of 32 on this scale, then you've had a near death experience. I mean, that's really arbitrary, even though you're doing it scientifically. It's actually just for standardization of scientific, you know, convenience of, of scientific um, experiments and stuff, if anything. So it's very diverse in the death experience. And some people are very shallow, to be honest, if you look at the 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 research like most near-death experiences are shallow and it's like with anything it's intuitively mo most near-death experiences are shallow because they're the commonest ones which occur and it's going to be fewer of the what you know whole population of people that have these ndes that will go to deeper states the fewer ndes which where the where they are pro more proximal to actual let's say irreversible death and that's where the deeper uh of of deeper, let's say, I mean, it's sort of not really a better way of saying it, more rich, you know, whatever, near-death experiences occur. Um, and it's in those which you'll have classic, let's say, 5-MeO type and peak mystical uh, states. Um, so, if, you know, most, most people are aware of, more popular of NDEs, which is a kind of funny recent cultural phenomenon in itself, you know, these sort of putting these otherworldly journeyers on a pedestal. Um, just because they died and came back and had this kind of crazy experience. But, you know, in a historical context, this has been happening forever. And it's this interesting new age kind of sort of surge of, of interest in in, uh, in celebritizing um, people that have, have NDEs. But anyway, people have these and um, and they're often quite deep, which is sort of warrants a book or so on them. And uh, you'll be able to find mystical experiences for sure within them um, and you can parallel them to 5-MeO but uh, basically an NDMT is different the peak of it so these experiences both at 5-MeO and NDMT they're basically like you know well range between 10 minutes half an hour or so and in the peak of it when the blood levels of uh, the brain the sort of synaptic DMT is sort of at its peak there will almost invariably be mystical type experiences but then the brain dynamics shift and instead of having it is neurally it's a very interesting thing because because there you can understand the mystical experiences i've described before the dis disintegration of the default mode and all of that jazz uh but then the blood levels sort of come down slightly and then there will be a breakthrough into this other world and that's you know if you listen to people like andrew gallimore and stuff and rick strassman originally um that is a very interesting phenomenon because usually you have your brain your, your brain is inhabiting this 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 false representation of the world that's not so false but it's it's a representation of the world and then that's blown blown up um, in the in the dmt state and suddenly there's a new world um i mean it's not dissimilar from a dream or specifically like a lucid dream state really um so as much as you can parallel the dmt state to the to the to the to the near death state, you can also parallel it and the near death state to the lucid dream kind of state because it is a new, profound world uh, which could you know theoretically be uh, explicated in terms of uh, the generation of a novel uh, internal um, uh, internal brain brain model. It's the only difference is where is that new world coming from? That's that's the kind of question um that's that's still interesting and intriguing and open um yeah okay, uh, are we ready so are we ready to move on to the next question and then gmt is a better model of that new world that's mm -hmm. kind of what i'm saying 5meo is kind of contentless sort of worldless and maybe more accurate things though is actually it's all the content uh but then with nmgt it it seems to model the this more dualistic uh journey like um experience of, of a kind of exploring a, a, a novel world so th that but then again even that's only a shallow 
uh, parallel to make between the NMG2 experience and the near-death experience. Because all I'm saying is that what NMGMT creates new worlds or leads to the emergence into new worlds, and then so does so does near-death experience. But actually, if you look at the content, which basically is what my most of my PhD is about, the content of it is vastly different. And what I mean by content is like I'm, I'm talking about the specific way that the subjective experience manifests. Um, you know, you can have the same structure of like you meet beings, you go to other worlds, you, you're after being disembodied and but then all of the different ways that that can occur, which is essentially infinite, will be very, very idiosyncratically DMT-like and psychedelic and sort of fluctuating and kaleidoscopic and bizarre in nature and imagery. And then, and then with the near-death experience, it's actually interestingly quite stable, almost, almost circumscribed and, um, and uh and 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 can be more yeah contiguous with like religious um imagery and is more personal uh it seems to be less like this deluge of kind of the collective unconscious which seems to occur on dmt and you know of course you have that life review and it seems to be almost biographic in many ways with the near-death experience so there's qualitative differences uh, I mentioned your first one. The second one is the near-death experience, or well, the near-death was actually sold in 2002 by You Know Who. I'm guessing you probably know who. I, I don't. Um, and the third one, psychedelic. Uh, uh, psychedelic should have no part in near-death experience or research as they don't affect the NDE, but severely distorts it. Um, and that's kind of the, the last question. And to, uh, uh, to answer your kind of your fourth question, has the guest you even had a near-death experience or just studied it uh, he hasn't had one he's he's kind of studying the relationship between psychedelics and near-death experiences um for his uh, phd course so um those three statements if you want me to repeat any of them let me know but what's your thoughts on uh, on those yeah. i mean i have i haven't had a near-death experience but like i was sort of said with the the parallels with the dream state um a kind of triangulation of, of psychedelic near death and, and dream states. Um, quite interesting synchronicity. Night prior to my starting my my uh, PhD course two thousand two thousand nineteen, I had a dream which was I took the near death experience scale. I know I just kind of critiqued it, but you know just for a laugh. And uh, the dream was a bona fide uh, phenomenologically near-death experience. I mean, what will be referred to as a near-death-like experience, because obviously I wasn't proximal to death, um, but my brain activity may well have mirrored that which uh, may occur under, under the near-death state, which is why uh, it looked so similar. It was a very interesting, very, very, very profound, very long, very lucid, um, elaborate dream, which had a lot of the sequences of the features of a near-death experience. So that's as close as I came. <laughs> so the other three things so can i just first pick up on the near near death was solved in 2002 by you know who i literally yeah. don't know what, that, that no, what ne neither do I. I i my guess would be sam parnia or maybe i don't know if he was 2002 uh eugene is that right we could just clarify who you mean and i suppose it might be worth going on to the second um second point while we're waiting for him because there's a little bit of a delay so the, what were the other two questions sorry so um well, there are more statements and questions the first one was uh, i worked on one with grayson and pmh at water too most are shallow because they aren't completely remembered the idea that isn't remembered and the other thing was and the other one was psychedelic should have no part in near-death experience re uh, near-death experiences or research as they don't affect the nde but it severely distorts it mm okay well the remembering thing yeah that's fair enough um i think there's something to be said about state dependent memory um and that's the case when you have psychedelic experiences as well um you go to such different spaces that it's actually quite intriguing that you can remember quite a lot of it obviously it depends different people people have different memories it probably corresponds to how well people remember dreams as well um uh but often people don't remember psychedelic experiences and there's just like an implicit memory of it um and yeah uh, but the state dependent memory thing is that you're inhabiting a fundamentally different state um when you're trying to recall that which you originally encoded in, in, in a completely different state and that diminishes 
efficiency of, of memory. So that could be happening with near-death experiences for sure. Um, if anything, that's another really interesting component of what I'm looking at, which is the similarities of just comparing psychedelic and near-death states, because if people have had psychedelic experiences subsequent to a previous near-death experience that they've had, um, then state-dependent memory as a process could be occurring that if they are similar, then it could be because within the subsequent psychedelic state, they are mimicking the neural state that was occurring at the time of the encoding of the original near-death state. And so that's kind of support that that uh, that psychedelics were involved uh, in the near-death thing. So that's, that's interesting. Um, but yeah, memory, sure, they can be... I'm not, I mean, I'm not critiquing the near-death experiences by saying that most of them are superficial. That's the last thing I'm doing. I'm just saying that, like, for instance, 2014, Charlotte Verville, uh, the, probably the best institution at the moment for studying near-death experiences um, in the University of Liège, you know, found, did a good... A, it was a large cohort of people applying the, the near-death experience scale to and, um, and finding... So it's probably the most reliable thing for finding what the commonest features were. And the commonest features were just having an out-body experience, feelings of peace, uh, time transcendence, and seeing kind of like a light in the dark. That is what that in the grand scheme of the wider phenomenological territory of near-death experiences, that is the beginning phases. That's almost like just you know, like the out-of-body phase. Um so it's yeah. But again, it's not a critique, it's just a statistical thing. But like you say, it could also be memory. They could well go there and just not remember. Um, I mean, it, this, these things can, even if they're like in, the term, in terms of those ones which are eventually remembered, even if they are positive in their valence, they can still be so at odds, you know, because these experiences just happen to anyone, the average Joe, that have their own preconceptions of what the universe is like. It can be completely ontologically shattering. Um, and so there could well be motivation for repressive, you know, unconscious, that is, mechanisms. And that's especially the case if, they're, if they did ensue to have challenging near-death experiences, which those, I'm sure, uh, are, are less reported. I think that at the, the approximation at the moment is 14% of near-death experiences actually are challenging in some way. But uh, it may well be even more than that because of these repressive kind of memory issues. Um, so that's that. And the thing that they mentioned about about uh, the psychedelics shouldn't have anything to do with near-death experiences because it distorts it. Um, I mean, I'd say on the one hand, you're, we're kind of singing from the same hymn sheet uh, in that there is a kind of, dist I wouldn't say distortion, um, I'd just say there are qualitative content differences between psychedelic states and, and, and the death states. Not all the time, certainly a minority. Basically, psychedelics are NDE mimetics some of the time. So that means even when they do mimic uh, near-death experiences as a proportion of like all psychedelic experiences, the, even with that proportion, it's the mimesis more than an actual generation of the exact phenom phenomenology. Um, so there's that, and then, th but he might, this person might be referring to, like, the administration of similar drugs at the point of death, which then might distort or interrupt the, or the spontaneous occurring of, of, an, of, of, of a near-death experience. If that's anything that he's alluding to, then that's interesting, um, although there are some papers, theoretical papers, which are suggesting giving psychedelics to people not in palli not 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 sorry near death at the precipice of actual death per se, but in coma states where 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 um, death is possible spontaneously or you know re removal of life support, um, and that is because they basically it's down to entropy again. Uh, I know we've got a kind of entropy dissident on, on the line at the moment, but uh, um, because psychedelics increase entropy and there is a very important relationship between entropy and richness of consciousness. So entropy can be increased by the administration of these drugs to uh, to people in coma, which is a bit out there, um, but that's kind of 
crazy that the kind of psycho renaissance has kind of got there at this at this point that we're actually discussing the possibility of this um but there's even things like um uh what's his name um uh not sabo uh frexka uh eg frexka hungarian chemist and he is advocating the administration of dmt near death because it's so potently neuroprotective and even is evidence of, of neuro and synaptogenesis happening with dmt so it's kind of just like a hijacking of what presumably is happening endogenously anyway um the production of dmt near death i think that probably does happen we don't actually have we've got really good supporting evidence for that but it probably well most definitely doesn't contribute to the like the lion's share of the actual near-death experience but it may well have very important physiological roles of protecting the brain at the point of hypoxia near death um so he's kind of saying well why not just administer dmt um because it will do an even better job um than what you will happen endogenously i'm pretty sure stuart hammeroff was it stuart hammeroff that suggested doing the same ketamine as well for exactly the same reasons mm -hmm. Okay, let's move on then to um, uh, where are you? There, Sarah J uh, Sarah Jane's question. Um, I would be interested to know Pascal's opinion on the evolutionary function of the NDE as a survival mechanism and a component of thanatosis. And I believe, for those who don't know, thanatosis is, is thanatosis basically playing dead, death feigning. Mm. Uh. What, so, sorry, what was the question? What is the role of the near-death experience evolutionarily? Uh, let me read it again. I'll, I'm sorry, I'll have to keep muting you every time because of the echo. Uh, it is, uh, Sarah, would be interested to know your opinion on the evolutionary function of the NDE as a survival mechanism and the component of thanatosis. Yeah. Um... I... You know, I I saw that paper um, kind of explaining the near-death experience in terms of death feigning or thanatosis, and it seemed to be very completely. It didn't completely convince me. Just first of all, just that it uh, doesn't really account for the experience. Um, it may account for like a, 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 a an externally apparent death-like state. But uh, I don't really see how the, 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 the experience, or especially the extremely elaborate nature of the experience, can be accounted for that kind of model. But other than that, the evolutionarily, the evolutionary part of the question, um, yeah, I mean, it seems, I mean, sort of by definition, everyone that has an near death experience conquers death so it might well have some survival function in and of itself there and we see spontaneous remissions occurring uh quite uh frequently with with near-death state you know people who are riddled with tumors or, or what have you and there is what would either be called you know sudden curing miraculous curing or spontaneous remission um and yeah i mean so it could have these evolutionary uh functions but I think the the development of of these neural or you know, neurophysiological mechanisms when the body becomes in acute stress, so, you know, in the kind of ultimate, the pinnacle of that such acute stress being the precipice of, of death, and your body being completely, you know, well fundamentally injured or just in an acute state of of, of, of lack of oxygen. Um, that these mechanisms will only make sense to have, to have been evolutionarily selected for um and that we may well see that in in the manifestation of of, of dmt release are they ketamine like compounds obviously ketamine is a synthetic well actually it's not synthetic it's been found in a mushroom recently but it's uh it's um, always it's the bloody mushrooms it's always the black mushrooms um but yeah it's not synthesized by human body as far as we know but there may well be other compounds um magnesium even um and uh uh so-called endopsychosins but that's just a hypo hypothetical thing but ketamine like compounds which might be released for the same reasons of being very uh even having some anti-inflammatory effects um but to the, the neuroprotective effects are kind of foremost amongst the reasons why they could be they could be released near death um 
but there's so if you read a paper called uh what's it called well it was by this, this individual called lee in 2015 and um it basically puts any kind of obscene ordeal to look at the nuanced similarities between DMT and the death experience kind of to shame because it's an incredibly sophisticated um, um, microanalysis uh, study on all of the neurotransmitter changes as well as electrocortographic changes that occur in the dying rodent model. And um, there's just such a shit ton of activity that happens at a point of, a point of near death or, or, or actual death and just preceding it. Um, and, you know, that also includes serotonin. So those are the, that's the transmitter system, which, that, which I know we spoke about this in the, in the, when we did this before, Darren, but then um, serotonin is, is really mass, is obscenely upregulated. Uh, and that's the system which DMT um, would act upon. Um, so, but if you look at that paper, there's actually this kind of dynamic which appears to occur where this activity, well, there's a there's a relationship, so they're mapping the activity relationship between the cortex and the heart, and during the dying process, there's uh, uh, an upregulation of of this mutual bidirectional kind of activ activity, uh, but seemingly for the forestalling of death. Uh, like you know, all this up, this, this increase of transmitters for 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 survival, promoting, um, you know, physiological activity. But then, when there seems to be a point where the this heart brain access access suddenly suddenly is in favour of death, so it it there's a signal to end organismal activity basically and that is seen that seems to be the kind of this threshold of the point of no return of of of, of irreversible death so evolutionarily there seems to be a, a real um yeah sophisticated sets of mechanisms for what happens what happens in a death um and it's almost like pulling there's there's do all you can to save the organism if you get past a certain point pull the plug <laughs> mm. But then again, anyway, so about the the, redu the reducing of the near death date to all of this potentially evolutionarily conserved uh, activity, it's all well and good. But then this experience, and it's mainly the, the mystical experience, is the experience itself. You know, you, because the body as a as a full being, an organism is a, is aware in a, in a, in a, in a in this weird way of it being both physical and a mental being, right? So. If there's going to be attempts to to preserve the body, there are going to be equal attempts to preserve the mind. Um, if anything, it's more important to, to preserve the mind and the equilibrium of the mind because without the mind, there is no experience of the body. So that's, that's pointless anyway. So there would be special, um, uh, yeah, uh, f f frameworks to 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 to. to promote the well-being of the mind at this stage and so that could involve dis dissociation um and and the, obviously a kind of endogenous and anesthesia but this diso this psychological dissociation makes sense so this kind of out of body experience and the bliss that certainly can be accounted for again kind of more, in a more mechanistic way but then why the fuck basically um <laughs> do you have a mr found like mystical experience and you know and again i've already kind of discussed the possible neural cor correlates of the mystical experience um so fair enough but then there's also the question well well why would that happen and you can just say well it's just an epiphenomenon you know it's just so happens that you know when this neural activity happens for self-preservational purposes there is this mystical experience it seems pretty weird to me that something as utterly profound as that will just be a complete evolutionarily evolutionary fart you know basically but then there's also the whole journey um why would these compounds which seem to preserve your neurons send you on this this journey and it's not a tr it's not a, it's not a trivial journey you know like when, what what the, the most the thing that call, always brings me back to the near-death experience is, is is yeah i love the neuroscience and i love getting a kind of a, a, like excessively detailed with the with the 
experience itself but actually it's really beautiful um and it te- and it you can learn a lot about experience um in within life it might be this transpersonal experience but the point of it is is interpersonal and that's again a deeply shamanic thing it's like the the point of their service and community is to go to these places which are transpersonal in nature they've got nothing to do with this world as it were but they they've actually got everything to do with this world they bring back the light they bring back knowledge um for it's not just for them to dick around with it's for them to give to other people um and that's a beautiful thing and we see this in a, in a, in a near death experience this en- emphasis on yeah i mean you with all these evolutionary theories in mind but then you end up being face to face with this fucking being of light which is just sh- just emanating total like unconditional love to you and saying why didn't you spend your life better you could have spent your life in so so much so much more love than you did and you could have done this work which could have made endless ripples you know throughout eternity and you didn't and you just you, you wasted you know not maybe quite as judgmental they're very non-judgmental but this is the point this is the point of these inc- these very deep and 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 pers- personally relevant and relevant for like this earthly seemingly trivial world like all of this occurs in the near death state and it's very hard to reduce that yeah yeah okay great so um let's now oh and to clarify i think if i'm reading eugene your statement correctly about the um you know who who solved ndes i think he was talking about himself were you talking about yourself there eugene uh, in which case i'm not going to uh, answer or ask your other questions because they kind of give that light of you know the gotcha question so i'm not going to focus on them i think a lot of them have been answered elsewhere I'd, I'd kind of like to clarify as well i know we talked about this in our in our own discussion but i think it's an important one what are your thoughts um on the link between psychedelics and and in general this the phenomena of um, veridical perception in near-death experiences which is the thing that kind of points me more toward their genuine nature of mind brain either separation or non-creation kind of relationship yeah yeah yes we did talk about that in previous um, podcasts i mean it, i it's really super compelling which is why lots of people kind of want to talk about it all the time because it's um yeah i mean it's not that favorable you know really that there are there are these years long multi site you know, multi hospital prospective studies to kind of to to lend you know real robust credence to these things like the like Sampania's aware study um and then they didn't find <laughs> anything um they did i mean albeit to be fair they did find something but they only found something which is the same which would be the, 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 the same rigor as all of these other anecdotes because it was within the context of a study but not within the confines of the actual empirical setup that someone had a cardiac arrest and had an out-of-body experience and reported these medical procedures and reported the nurse and recognized the nurse and what he looked like and what he was wearing and the particular procedure that happened this one person on the aware study but they didn't have the out-of-body experience at a, a position where the card was placed and they didn't report what was said on the card which is the point of the study right so that's an annoying thing you could say it's like in a kind of more poetic sense or that's a classic like of course that's going to happen the classic trickster of the paranormal which is what sometimes uh, referred to as like you can't whatever you do you can't you can't actually pin down mm. what what we in england would call sod's law <laughs> yeah yeah exactly um right <laughs> yeah um but you could also say it was just not you know they're, they're still ironing out the methodological details and, and all mm. that jazz um but yeah there's still tons of these these anecdotal um reports would you i don't know oh, would, would, uh, would you consider them anecdotal if they're if they're third party kind of verified or do you think you could reasonably call them more kind of case studies as opposed to anecdotes? 
that's what I was sort of saying. Yeah, I wouldn't say them as anecdotes pejoratively. It's yeah, case studies. Fine, that's mm-hmm. that's fair enough because many of them have lots of medical um, data associated with them, and there is corroboration and things like that. So mm-hmm. it's all good. It's all it's all promising evidence. It's just um, this unfortunate thing of you know um, extraordinary claims. You know, so you need in order to in order to flip the scientific paradigm on its head you need the scientific you need you need science <laughs> the kind of frontiers of scientific methodology to that's the only paradigm that's going to be able to flip itself on its head if you know what i mean they're not going to accept anything else um science has to undermine itself if it's going to happen if that makes mm-hmm. sense you know mm-hmm. what i mean um, yeah. So I have Panda who wants to make a quick comment on that. If that's okay, Pascal, I'll just invite you in to speak, Panda. Yeah. The reason they didn't uh, spot the experimental setup wasn't because uh, they failed to do so. It was because the uh, the OBEs actually didn't happen in the in the rooms where the visual uh, shelf was implemented. This is, Parnia's, this is Parnia's study. Yeah, Parnia's study. Yes. Yeah. That's what I said. The, the 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 people who had the cardiac arrest and had the OBEs, they did they didn't happen in the rooms where the cards were. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that because a lot of people think that um, it was a failure on the experiences parts. And I, hmm. I suppose as well, you know, it's um, ev- 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 um, absence of evidence doesn't, of course, equal absent evidence or whatever. You know, the, you know the saying: just because there was no results doesn't mean it's not. It's not true as such. I think the the sample sizes as well and the number of OBEs that came out of it was um, unfortunate because it was all very small. Was I think one OBE case for, or one person that had an OBE that survived. So you'd need a much better sample than that, unfortunately, to have any chance of any hits. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, like most of them, most of them did just die. Um, yeah, I mean, so the, there's a the really cool OBE stuff. Um, and but then there's 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 loads of psychological phenomena that occur um near death and and there's actually you know there's a couple of papers i'm aware of at least of of, of these sort of psychic after effects which happen after the the the, the near death experience people become much more they've been recalibrated and uh, they all these precognitive um uh, experiences synchronicities uh intuitions sort of open up but then there's not actually a lot of literature on 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 the actual in the acute state of of the of the near death experience of of these similar possible possibly like non local kind of mm. uh, behavior of, of consciousness. I mean, there is plenty of categories of them and examples. So the so blind people having this, this you know Ring and 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 Cooper um their their studies on blind congenitally blind death experiences that is that is intriguing um there needs to be more i don't think more phenomenological like data on that is going to be enlightening um but there needs to be more theoretical um kind of yeah understanding of of of, of, of what's going on there because yeah i mean congenitally blind people reporting reporting not just that they saw but they, they, they were they were reporting allegedly like like full-fledged near-death experiences but with but with but with vision you know and it seems to be quite clear that if they never knew what sight was and then they have a certain experience and then they say that they saw it it that in and of itself is quite compelling even though there's a real kind of philosophical problem of well, you don't know what sight is, so you're obviously the last person to, to, to trust in terms of saying, I saw. That said, the other kind of theory for that, and again, it's le- borrowing from, from you know, my whole thing of equilibrating, sorry, like equ- equating, not quite equating, but paralleling near death and psychedelic states. The psychedelic state is very inductive of synesthetic states. And my supervisor, Dave Luke, literally just published a really good paper on this, looking at looking at all different psychedelic states and all different um types of synesthesia from people with congenital synesthesia and people without and basically lsd is particularly good at producing synesthesia even novel types of synesthesia in people who are already synesthetic 
uh, who and and um, it's normally audiovisual. So this stuff happens in psychedelics. It, and, so, and again, if you actually read near death reports carefully, there's a ton of synesthetic activity which happens there. So that said, these near death experiences in the blind could be synesthetic in that they're reporting, oh my god, I saw, but it could well be I. I experienced a very novel sensorial you know input and that can be a merging of senses which could feel like a kind of novel sense in, in itself but then even then i think that they're fully aware of what all their other senses are and they would be more apt to describe them as a melding of senses um as opposed to sight um but then it, yeah it could well be possible that if it's if there's an audiovisual thing going on audio like audition could in a synesthetic way lead to inherent occipital cortex activity um, and lead to light and lead to some kind of visual impression but when you have so that's fair enough and they could see something but it, given the complete cortical reorganization that happens of the occipital like it's basically all re-recruited re, re by proximal sensory modalities if when it's congenital the idea that they can see light and colors is fair is possible but the fact that you then have reports of these people saying that you are that they're having out body experiences and they're, be, they're recognizing their body that and they can see themselves and their whole body and they can see all of their hair and they're describing how their hair is and they recognize them because of their hair that that and, and they're saying that it's through vision that is weird <laughs> if you, yeah sure okay brilliant um so i'll keep forgetting i need to mute you so um watcher asks and we're coming i think to the last few questions there'll be more no doubt um where are you watcher uh pascal what are your thoughts on ndes that don't entail a being of light such as reported hindu ndes which are quite different in nature but have similar themes um what did i think of that so uh, i mean it seems that like i kind of mentioned with near-death experiences there's there's this biographic or, or at least more culturally specific thing that happens i mean when you talk about dmt people it's just to a penny you know people saying describing these beings that they've never seen before and then then finding out that they are these particular deities of this obscure religion that they've never heard of and things like that um whereas with with the near-death experiences that i have seen reports you know nothing's ever 100 percent. you know where they see a being and they didn't recognize them and, and then they have them um, and they kind of corroborate them but for the most part it seems that they are conti continuous with that person's cultural history um uh i would say though that in in bruce grayson's book after he wasn't clear but he did say that two-thirds of the beings met in near-death experiences are not continuous with the person's belief system but then it, he didn't clarify to say what proportion of that are actually beings which are completely unrecognizable and the person had never seen before, mm. as opposed to simply um, being which they just didn't recognize for, for any other reason. Like there wasn't actually a, 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 a clear thing there. So um, certainly the case that that for for people who have specific belief systems most of them will either have a totally of amorphous kind of non non-culturally tied experience and that might be what what bruce is referring to within that two-thirds um or they will actually have uh experiences which are consistent with what their belief system is so christian will see jesus and you know we'll see Buddha and all that um and that's even what the tibetan book of the dead uh, says um that one will see that which their mind will most easily manifest for them and um, based on what the contents of their mind i mean that is that is the buddhist that is the buddhist 
approach is everything is mind dependent and mind created the whole, whole universe and that includes deities that will be seen at at um at death uh so but then that while that's ancient tibetan uh delineation of it that's exactly what would be expected uh from a modern neuroscientific kind of perspective on the, in the predictive coding uh, framework that i was referring to where and similarly in the, in the psychedelic state when you have fractals being thrown at you from every dimension or literally and there's this basically this, uh, this uh, ambiguous data sensory data which is which has just been suddenly released uh, to your conscious awareness and your brain uh, is trying to make sense of it so the very mechanisms by which your brain finds patterns and and links it to its prior its preconceptions as to what the world looks like so that matching uh the, pre the predictive aspect of the predictive process that's gone out the it's not gone out the window but it's highly undermined and so it's desperately attempting to make sense of what it's being shown basically by by fluidly uh sort of flowing between different possible ex explanations basically interpretations of what it's seeing and it, and then it tries to kind of hone in on 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 the best guess the best guess of of what's occurring in front of it and then that so that could be a process of what's going on with uh, the near death state as well that you're in this very altered state and your predictive processing is is, is sort of somewhat compromised um, but you're trying to make the best guess as to what it is that you're seeing or rather your neocortex is um, and then if you see uh, if you have an impression of, of, a, of what's called the sense presence right if there's if there's a light and there's and there's a being which you feel to be there um, and again that may be again just in a just to have recourse to the neuroscience and not necessarily fully reducing it but there are there is evidence to suggest that the that there are centers in the brain uh, which are are related to a theory of mind and empathy and 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 social cognition. They could be released, and therefore you have this subjective impression of there being a presence there. So if is that if that's happening uh, in this sort of state of light uh, sensory input, then there could be a projection, just like the Tibetan Buddhist state, just like predictive coding coding would would predict. Um, there's this kind of projection of uh, a, a, a figure which it, your psychical repertoire is kind of familiar with. Um, I think that's a good like working model, but I think it's still not certainly not perfect because when yeah when uh, when the just is well, I always come back to the kind of detailed baroque kind of highly vivid nature of these kind of beings um the the neuroscience i just I, I, it doesn't always seem to be fully adequate um but but yeah certainly with with it, hindu there's a classic one of seeing rama or or not rama um yama or or who's also referred to as chitra gupta which means the man with the book um and a staff um and there's this interesting clerical error which occurs um where you know they say oh you're not supposed to be here you know we got we got the wrong guy we wanted this guy not this guy and they got the the, the surname slightly mixed up and and then you, you have to be back on your way and go back to earth and we have to get you know get this get get this other guy to come to the afterlife um that is intriguing as well because i just and that's pretty common and in terms of the function of these beings and what they're doing like and that and like reducing it like i just think that's absurd like how can that be just neurally even culturally i mean it's possible i mean if if it's aware if individuals are aware enough of these on a conscious level of these processes happening um you know like there being these funny clerical er errors which might be culturally discussed or, or or written in hindu text then possible that it comes up in the near-death experience but i just I, I just i just think it happens too commonly in near-death experience i think people are individually not consciously aware of this stuff such that it it may well be a collective unconscious thing which is happening
that this experience has happened to people for thousands of years and uh, somehow we're, we're accessing them when we get into the near-death state and that's why we see these culturally specific things even if we're unaware of them personally.